Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, I have uh, not only one but two hard acts to follow and a hard act to proceed with the Rif Mustafa Akil coming. And I feel a bit abashed. I felt particularly abashed at hearing John speak because uh, after he had gone to America, uh, I was briefly moved in to be Margaret Thatcher's speechwriter. And uh, it wasn't, it was after she'd fallen and, you know, the, the, um, she was still in good vigor and she was, of course, invited to talk quite a lot. Now, uh, she got an invitation to Frankfurt to talk to the Buddhist Bank and uh, God forgive me, I rather approve of modern Germany and we used to have um, rows about it. And I did manage to make her make a, do a, a pro-German speech and she was pro-German for a good week. And, uh, but while we were doing it, oh, we had rows. And she would say, where's John? And throw things and throw to be temperamental. And uh, obviously John did this. He played her like a, like a Stradivarius. <laughs> it was a brilliant performance. Now, I don't want to talk about what John has to say about uh, Europe, but I have a very difficult one to follow, which is John Derbyshire talking about uh, China. And um, he said, with reference to Turkey, that perhaps Turkey, with 90 years, having got rid of an empire, adopted a republican constitution, perhaps Turkey can be some sort of model for China, despite these, this long millennial history of oriental despotism. Uh, it's going to be a very difficult act to follow. Now, uh, I'll do my best, but Turkish history is quite complicated, and the, whether Turkey, whether the Ottoman past is actually a guide in any way to the Turkish present is a very good question. You know, you can look at English history and you can see, you know, you, you can't do it these things directly, but you can look, you can get a general sense of the history and the character of the place, and it's a sort of vague guide to the present. Uh, you know, if you look at, um, Europe, at English, or for that matter, European portraiture, from the moment when, I suppose, in the 14th century, representational paintings come up, you can see the national face emerging. I mean, as I look in the mirror, I can recognize very obviously um, a, a sort of pudding-faced Scotsman. And uh, you can see these things back in the 14th century. It's not so easy with the Ottoman Empire. Uh, you can actually, if you look at the, at the, the porcelain, curiously enough, the little faces in these miniatures of Persian type, you can see the faces of, well, the waiters in this hotel, in another version. But it's very difficult to take the Ottoman Empire as any sort of model for modern Turkey. Uh, I think I can do it, and I've got a thesis which I will advance which is that what we are living through at the moment is um, a version, a smudgy version, of what Turkey went through in the 1880s and 1890s under Abdul Hamid, when with the kind of politicized religion, there was, for the last moment, a revival of the Ottoman Empire expressed in the fabulous buildings of the European of, the, of Izmir or Constantinople, uh, or the railways which begin to snake around, and the emergence of a, a government machine which is capable of doing the sort of things that government machines have to do. Now, that's, uh, I'm not going to go on too much about this, but when at the, at the present phase, Turkey is in, in, in an interesting moment of renewing with the Ottoman past, not saying, as was done 90 years ago, the Ottoman past is so much junk, let's get away from it. This is year one of 
the Republic. Not doing that, but going back. And it's, it's curious, you know, just knocking around in Turkey. If, if I go on the bus quite often from Ankara to Istanbul. And if I get out at Chalayan, the, the taxi driver, when we, we got talking, but the taxi driver will talk about the television things which are shown now very, very popular. The latest one is about Suleiman the Magnificent. Um, but there have been plenty of programs where serious historians talk about this or that aspect of the Ottoman past. And the history has very much come alive. Sometimes wrong, but it's there. And it is, um, it's an interesting phenomenon. Now, before I get on to talking about, uh, well, my title is What Makes Turkey Work, before I approach this vast and formidable subject, um, uh, I might start by saying that, you know, although there are good books on Turkey, not as many by Turks on their own modern history as there ought to be. They've left that to foreigners. Remarkable. But uh, there's still a sort of idea which goes round that, uh, which can only be described as the black legend of Turkey. Now, I've, uh, I think it's eroding. I think more Europeans, and the Americans have never been anti-Turkish. They're the best foreigners here, by the way. The, um, the Europeans are beginning to understand that it's not all black, but because a lot of students go. My star, I mean, I've had many good students here. My star got a, a Microsoft scholarship to Cambridge. And uh, he, I, mean, I, I heard about the interview from three sources. One, obviously, from him. Two, from a friend of mine who was on the board. And three, from one of the defeated candidates, who realized when he heard the laughter coming from inside the room that he'd lost. And uh, little Murat has gone off to Cambridge, and I said, well, how is, what's it like? He said, it's all right, but it's just it, terribly difficult, because people keep saying to me, what about human rights in Turkey? What about position of women? Wasn't there an Armenian genocide? What about the poor old Kurds? He said, how should I deal with it? I said, listen, it's simple. Just say, yes, it's true, but the sex is heaven. <laughs> <laughs> And there is this black legend which goes on. It has been, I have to say, it's been fomented, most obviously, by the Armenian diaspora. And this, this is something I know something about. And let's put it this way. The Armenians were not innocent. They were doing their share of the slaughtering as well. And you cannot say that the Ministry of the Interior said, wipe the Armenians out. That's all forgeries. Nasty things happened, a lot of theft, um, but not in, and it's not a genocide. The Armenians jump up and down, up and down, up and down, in the European Parliament, in here, there, everywhere, uh, trying to take advantage, obviously, of American law to um, try and extract compensation from the Deutsche Bank or French insurance company, on and on. The ones who, I think, have made a terrible mistake are the Greeks. It, um, it, has, it has done them no good at all to, uh, to frustrate Turkey's entry. Uh, the, the, what happened on Cyprus, everybody knows who was there at the time, is by no means 100% Turkish guilt and Greek innocence. If you listen to Greeks talking about it, you get the impression that the Greek Cypriots were just dancing around their maypoles with their bouzouki music, when all of a sudden a hairy squat people arrived and went pop, pop, pop. Not at all. The, um, and yet that is the version which uh, somehow spread around the Western world. And the Greeks have gone on for quite a long time, making life difficult for the Turks over endless silly little issues, particularly now, obviously, the European matter. Um, it is something which they ought to regret. It is in no way in Greece's interest to get on so badly with her major neighbour and, and, she, and she will simply provoke trouble. It's simply not true to say that historically Greeks and Turks 
were enemies. In 1453, when the Turks arrived, the first port of call of the Sultan was on the Orthodox Patriarch. And the Orthodox Patriarch had one hatred in his life, the Latins. The, um, the, uh, the Latins had, 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 had destroyed Constantinople in 1204 the, on the Fourth Crusade. They had, uh, that was when the Byzantine Empire was ruined. After that, it was taken over by, by, uh, by teams of rival Italians, Genoese, Pisans, Ven uh, Venetians. The population of Constantinople shrank from something close to a million to something like 50,000. The buildings were falling down. The last Byzantine emperor didn't pay his rent, and the, the Turks decided more or less to, to, to kick him out. Now, the Patriarch and Mehmet II did a pact that the, the Orthodox Church was the largest landowner in the empire. And the Patriarch had the rank of an Ottoman Pasha and all sorts of privileges attached to it. And the document was run together with the title that was used for a Byzantine emperor, Megas Athentes, Great Prince. Now, the Turkish ear can't accommodate certain combinations of consonants. They, that's why they call Smyrna Izmir. Uh, it's why uh, uh, Urgub in Cappadocia comes from the word Procopy and it couldn't accommodate Megas Athentes and you know what it turned it into? <laughs> Effendi. Uh, Effendi, the honorific of the Middle East, is actually a corruption of Byzantine Greek. And that sums up the relationship. It's only in modern times that there was any kind of rivalry. I'm sorry, now listen, i would be accused of using all sorts of unfortunate vocabulary in this, but uh, I often think that about 1453 and the siege of Constantinople, if you'll forgive me, the Turk saved the speck from the wall. And uh, that is more or less what happened in the setting up of the Ottoman Empire. Now it declined. Why? It's a very interesting question. And here you're, you're asking the question, why did China go? Uh, why, how did these non-European societies, great civilizations like China, why did they lose their impetus? It's very difficult to answer that. I have a suspicion about the Ottoman Empire that it might even be climate change. In the 17th century, you can see deforestation happening in central Anatolia. Maybe the strains of malaria or something. But at any rate, the decline happens. And you ask yourself, which country does Turkey resemble? It's a good one. And the answer is Spain. If you think Spain, five centuries of Islam, and very grand most of the time, um, an empire, Latin America, Peru conquered by 2,000 Spaniards, etc. A very grand civilization, the architecture, everything. And then, around about 1600, signs of trouble, and 1700, it's rotting, actually more than Turkey. And then uh, comes a very sad period in the 19th century, when the army becomes a the maker of politics. Its relationship with Europe is expressed first by the Spanish experience in the Peninsular War, and then, of course, the, the horrible civil war in the 20th century. Um, and it's only in, what, the 1970s, after Franco, that you can see some kind of Spanish recovery happening. But other little parallels, the um, uh, the Catalans. Who do you think the Catalans resemble? The Greeks of Anatolia, the creative minority. And who, pray, are the Basques? Seven Basque languages, only one of them particularly developed. 
living in mountains, one part of them fanatically religious, the other half, the other part taking part in, in the terrorist activity of ETA, the Kurds. You can see the Spanish parallel is something that works quite well. Spain has recovered, not at the moment, but it has recovered remarkably well, and I think that is the path that Turkey is on. Now, the, uh, the Turks started off in 1922 having lost about a third of the population. The Armenians, I'm sorry to bang on about this, I, uh, it's, but the Armenians uh, claim that they lost, so, well, a third of their population. The figures have expanded now to sort of two million. The figure they gave at the time was 800,000. Uh, but the fact is that in eastern Anatolia, there's you know, horrendous diseases, starvation going on, and a third of the population was wiped out. Refugees had come in from the Balkans, as earlier from the Caucasus, as earlier from the Crimea, and seven million refugees represented something like uh, two-fifths of the then population and half of the urban population in the town, in the town, town, in the town population. When the Turkish Republic was set up, they more or less had to create a language. Now, all this was forced on them. It's the Greeks and the Armenians and the French and the Italians and the British who tried to partition Anatolia and were, and were shown off. They are left with a, a country to create, and although those days are long gone, and really, more or less, they're simply not, it's, it's, not alive, it's not a model that's alive now. It's rather a heroic business when you think uh, you've got a whole country to remake. St start, let's start off with the language. This, uh, you know, um, England just grew. There's, uh, we never had to have a language reform, which is, uh, you know, people just wrote things, which is why we've got this absurd spelling. We never had a, a there was no academy of uh, English academy to standardise the language. So you spell enough with this ridiculous O-U-G-H and so on. Must be a nightmare for foreigners to learn, um, and never been reformed. Uh, an effort was made. I mean, England's a, such an interesting place. It's the first modern country. You wouldn't think so, and we've be, paid for it ever since. The, <laughs> the a monk at the time of the Thirty Years' War, that's to say, before printing, produced a book, uh, which was called Remorse of Consciousness, a uh, Remorse of Conscience. And England was fighting France at the time, and another patriotic monk said, these words are Latin, we have to change them to something Anglo-Saxon. And he translated it into the, the again bite of inwit, remorse is Latin for a get bite again, and, and inwit, you get it. Now, the English intelligentsia have many faults, many but no one has ever accused them of lacking a sense of humour. And a shout of laughter went up across the land, and language reform in England has never been heard of again. Now, not every country is as blessed as England in that respect. Um, the Ottoman nationalities had to invent a language, and the Greeks had fun. <laughs> so, there weren't, in Greek, words like um, uh, for obviously journalist or journalism or foreign travel. You know what the Greek for foreign travel is? Metaphora esoterica. Uh, and and the, the word for journalism is ephemeristica. Now the, the Turks are faced with the same sort of problem of having to create a language. And for them it's worse because they had a script which was Arabic in origin. And Arabic has got three vowels. Turkish has eight, if you include the umlauts. And so uh, it, they, its complicated diacritical marks have to be used to explain the vowels. 
And you know, the literate population in the Ottoman Empire, even after some sort of simplification of the language, can't have been more than about 10,000 in a population of, what, 21 million. And most of them may disagree with me about this, but the, when the Republic comes in, it wants to make the peasants literate, and it has to change the language. Now, if you're making peasants literate, you obviously simplify terribly, and all sorts of words just go. I love reading old Turkish dictionaries. They, they're, um, they're fascinating. You get words like ifrahat, which is described as the pride that a, son fe a father feels in his son's achievements. Or my favourite, which is mühalim. No one understands it now, but that means a condition of looseness of the bowels, which is just under control. <laughs> Sometimes I find myself using these things with taxi drivers to Scottish accent. The results are, are very funny. Now, the language reform is the first thing which comes in, and it's, it, it, this was drastic. Um, the counterpart has been that the writers of this country have got a patriotic mission, uh, which carries on to this day, uh, of, of advancing the language. And uh, the, 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 the other side of it is that people, the mass of the people are, are, are detached from their, well, they can't read their grandfather's tombs, tombstones. Uh, the Turks themselves are very badly divided on this. And um, some people say that the, the old Ottoman language could have been reformed without bringing in a whole set of Latin letters. But that was the deepest of the reforms. Now, the other reforms which come in, well, you know, if you were in a town in Turkey in 1930, you turn on the radio, you hear Mozart, you go to a university, you will find 1,000 academics, mainly German, and they were supposed to be headed by Einstein, coming and uh, doing the teaching and writing the textbooks. That was uh, the most extraordinary moment in the 1930s. And if you do that to a people, and you force Western standards on them, there's going to be some kind of reaction at some point. Now, it's all done. Uh, it's, well, you know, it obviously, it, the question hanging over these Middle Eastern events at the moment, Cairo, Tunisia, Tunisia was the first starting this process, and then um, the, the question hanging over the whole thing is, why are they not like Turkey? Why is Istanbul, Barcelona, and not Cairo? It's a very good question to ask, but I, I think the starting point of Anatolia in 1918, 22, is so very different from the Arab world that in the end this, this question was meaningless. Still, you know, the Atatürk, uh, the Atatürk revolution is something which took place it did, uh, it, it treated um, the, even the enlightened uh, Islam, uh, the en enlightened cleric, who was called uh, Said Nursi, they put him in prison for quite a long time. Uh, they changed Islam from the top and regulated Islam quite, quite heavily, at least in the towns. And if you were a traditional-minded Ottoman, you know, and after all, the native religion is, is, is it's inescapably part of yourself. It's something which you get as a small child and you grow up with. It's, it's I mean, using platitudes, it's system values, are things which are almost independent of the actual practice of the religion. It is very much part of yourself, and, and uh, in one form or another, and to try to suppress it is ob obviously dangerous. Now, uh, in the end, Atatürk was, he was an atheist, yes, but he was careful what he said in public. And what he did try to do was to encourage um, a different sort of Islam. 
Now, at this point, I should say, this government in Turkey has been very successful in all sorts of ways, They're quite remarkably successful. It's been the last, what, eight, nine years. And, and it is also the product of an Islam which does talk about reform. For instance, I saw the Prime Minister on television about a year ago. He was in Erzurum, which is a very pious place. The Ezan, the call to prayer, is deafening. And you see these women in, in, uh, women in black scuffling around the place. There is a place where you can get a drink, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's hidden in, in a back street. Uh, it's ugly Anatolian concrete, um, and so on and so forth. And the Prime Minister went there, and some woman turned up in the black outfit. The black, by the way, it's, it's, called, it's called chador, uh, in, uh, as you know. That is from the, from the Turkish word for tent. And he saw this woman uh, wearing her chador, and he said, look, you don't need to wear that sort of thing. It's, it's ugly, it's, it's, it does you no favours, get rid of it. Now you see, we have that kind of Islam, and that's, now what is wrong with it? And at the moment, if I say this kind of thing in Turkey, the secularists, the people who are on the side of the Republic, will say, no, no, the people who support this are traitors, they're only doing this to temporarily, and then we'll have the full weight of traditionalist Islam. I'm really not so sure. Uh, I hesitate to say anything as a foreigner, and you know, you, it, it's, as John Derbyshire said, even if you've been in a country for a long time, it is possible to make a complete fool of yourself in terms of prognosis. But I cannot myself yet see what, it, what there is to be alarmed about. Now, Turkey's come a long way. The Republican period, when you're making the peasants literate, when you're introducing elementary hygiene, which the Republic did with great, great success, uh, the schools, the country works. When the election comes up next in June, everybody knows it will work uh, in the main uh, without any kind of corruption or anything of that sort, except possibly in the Kurdish areas that uh, you know, all sorts of things do work in Turkey for a modern state. If you look at the economy, uh, very obviously, the Turks make things. It's nice to be, I mean, if you're British, you're in a country which doesn't make things by and large. <laughs> but in, it's nice to be in a country where you know, my students will, will think nothing of going into business, Microsoft, making things, selling pharmaceuticals all around the world. They do it uh, very well. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, Turkey's, in that respect, Turkey's been doing uh, very well indeed. Now, at the end of it, uh, it, it is, I think, going back to a period in, after about 1878, when they had lost the war, uh, the war that ended with the Treaty of Berlin. They lost uh, a good part of the Balkans. And <coughs> refugees streamed out of the Caucasus, especially, to be settled in miserable circumstances all over Anatolia. The Circassians, they're called, a million and a half of them, were thrown out of Russia. About 300,000 of them died in leaking boats in the Black Sea. God knows how many others died as they were resettled all around Anatolia, particularly in northwestern Anatolia. Um, they arrive, and then the last really serious Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Hamid, came up, and he used Islam as a way of unifying the empire. It didn't mean trouble for foreigners, quite the contrary. You could set up French language schools. The Americans set up missionary schools all over, all over the uh, Anatolia, in Beirut. Um, no trouble with foreigners. He, he stabilized the currency and ran things. There was a, a, one of the best buildings in modern Istanbul. It's called the, 
the Caisse de la Dette Ottoman. It's now the Istanbul Boys' School, and it's lit up just over the Golden Horn. The marvellous Italian building with gabling. That set up as the Europeans looked after the Turkish finances. You know, the Turks screamed about it, that it was, a, a, it was exploitation by the Europeans. It wasn't. It was a way of bringing down interest rates and encouraging investment. So Turkey did get railways, did get good buildings, did get banks, and it was quite a promising period under Abdul Hamid. And it's all done with a certain amount of... Uh, uh, oh, gosh, Islam in Turkey is... It's, 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 uh, it, it's not the sort of Islam you get in, even in Egypt. Uh, Abdul Hamid was... Uh, he, he, he drank the old brandy, uh, but he wasn't much of a drinker. But he was a terrible ladies' man. The Quran allows four wives. Abdul Hamid decreed that since he was the representative of God upon this earth, he would have seven. And he married his 17-year-old wife at the age of 58. The daughter of that marriage died not so long ago. Uh, and he, uh, he allowed the foreigners, the special, the, uh, the schools to go on. Now, what he, he, he doesn't stress Turkishness. What he does stress is Sunni Islam. Now, Sunni Islam is the one we live with in Turkey. It's, it doesn't make problems for foreigners. It, it, it does make problems for, for um, people who are not Sunni, namely the Alevis. They are a quarter of the population of just about in Turkey. Um, they have traditionally, they, they, their tradition is, is uh, formally, I say stress formally, Shia, as in Persia. But they are probably, you know, they, they owe a lot to the old religion of the Turks, shamanism coming from Siberia. There are obviously orthodox influences. They're very secretive and they flourished in the provinces. And uh, there is tension even now between this government and the Alevis, who are the backbone of the Republican and the left-wing parties. Uh, look, the parallel doesn't work. Don't take it seriously. But the, uh, the reason why Scotland got a reputation for being red was because in 1917 the Catholic third of the country voted Labour. Um, and it's much the same sort of thing here. And there are tensions of that kind which are, in the end, something historic. Now where does Turkey go from here? I think you take, uh, first of all, the line from 1922 to the present. And that's been steadily up. It's not been, it's not been you know, dramatic progress. It's, uh, it's not been a Korea, you know, Korea starting off exporting wigs in 1960, and then 40 years later, God knows what. It's not that. Uh, I don't think it ever would be. It's, it's, it's not that kind of place. Uh, nevertheless, the progress has been very steady. If I go to a Turkish public hospital, there's a bit of bureaucracy, but I know I get dealt with quicker than I, quicker than I would be in an English public hospital at the moment. I'd rather tend to trust Turkish schools as well. They're not bad at all um, at the top end. So from that level, all's well. There are tensions below the surface and sometimes just coming up. First of all, there's the big regional problem that the East is very different from the West. The, the, the Kurdish East is going to be a terrible headache for, for this country because you can't just solve problems like that by spending money. The problem is partly demographic. 40, you know, you, you find families with 40 children, uh, and which is a terrific strain on everything. There is... Um, uh, I hope very, very firmly that the country will stick together, but still there is no doubt that there is a tension now which has been created by a terrorist movement, uh, the PKK, which might prevent the in proper integration of the country. I don't know. I may say, I mean, I'm a Scotsman, 
Um, if there is one thing I detest in this world, it is tin pot nationalism. And the moment Scotland becomes independent, I become a Turk. How dare that kind of thing? Um, and uh, let's hope this country uh, sticks together because, in the end, it's been it's it's the best place that there is to be alive between Athens and Singapore. Thank you. Thank you.